people think I'm damaged goods. I'm worried about losing my job. Will I ever get a transplant? I want to see my children graduate from college. How can I afford this? I don't want to be a burden. I'm afraid. I'm overwhelmed with information. Sometimes I wonder if I'll ever fall in love and get married. I just want to play with my friends. You're listening to Kidney Talk, streaming health, happiness, and hope to the renal community with your hosts, Lori Hartwell and Stephen First. Well, welcome to another issue of Kidney Talk. We have a very special guest, David Rosenblum, who wrote a book called Becoming Me. And he has a very interesting story about how having kidney disease helped him come to terms with what he wanted in life. So welcome to the show, David. Thank you, Lori. Well, tell us a little bit about when you were diagnosed. Um, I was uh, living a very healthy life, and uh, I was in my late 50s, and um, my creatinine, which is a marker for kidney disease, had been fairly normal, around 1, 1 1.2, and within a four-month period, it went to 6. Oh, wow. What was the cause? Uh, it turned out it was high blood pressure, and it also turned out that I was only living on one kidney. Oh, you only, knew uh, you, you only whole, had one kidney. For my Well, I had two kidneys. One was essentially not working. It was vestigial. Oh, okay. So I probably had a history of kidney disease in my family. We didn't know it. Now, did you know you had high blood pressure? No. Every time I'd gone to the doctor previously, my perfect blood pressure. Oh, that's crazy. So usually when patients go to the doctor, their blood pressure is higher. But in your case, no, and I never you had, were able to make it lower. I never had white coat syndrome either. <laughs> oh, okay. So, well, that's interesting. But my, so, but my blood pressure within a four-month period, was it went from normal to, to 200 over 100. And they never knew what was the reason for that? When I saw several doctors get different opinions, and um, by that point, my kidney function was probably around 15%. Wow. Uh, I was fortunately, I still was still urinating, fortunately. And uh, they got me into dialysis immediately. I had a fistula, uh, a semino fistula put in. And um, I was like diagnosed. And then two weeks later, I was in surgery for the fistula. And they put a catheter in my chest and I was in dialysis. You were in dialysis. So this and is I a very sudden extreme. kidney was, dialysis It start. was literally falling off a cliff and I was uh, in total shock. Uh, if my wife hadn't been there taking notes, I don't know what we would have done. It was being like hit by a Mack truck. And um, I honestly, this was in June, and I honestly thought I didn't, wouldn't make it to the end of the year. Well, uh, and this was back in 2002. 2002. And I had given myself a goal that year when I got sick. And it's funny how you do these kind of things. And I said, I'm going to stay alive long enough to see the first Harry Potter movie. <laughs> and I've funny. seen all of them. <laughs> you've seen all of them. So you've accomplished that goal. <laughs> Well, one of the things that you had a near-death experience. I mean, we all have had many as patients, but can you tell us a little bit about that? I was on dialysis for over six years, and the last three I had done my own at home, hemodialysis at home, and it was very successful. I was doing short-term daily dialysis uh, and very, very happy with it. And um, transplant almost became uh, an afterthought, and I got the call, like everybody does when you don't expect it. Mm -hmm. And I was in good health. Uh, the kidney was a good match, four out of six antigens, and the transplant went very, very well. I was fine. They kept doing testing, you know, the usual biopsies, ultrasounds, and so on. And then they discovered about four months after I had the transplant, that the flow to the kidney was uh, reduced, and they were worried that there was scar tissue buildup in the renal artery leading to the new kidney. So they wanted to put some stents, like similarly to what they do, angioplasty, what they do with heart patients. Yeah, they put a little, like, it's like a little straw so the flow doesn't get... It's a, it's a yeah. spring, actually. It's a little metal cage, cage. that they oh, okay. expand... That they expand oh, and it so forces the yeah it forces it forces the scar tissue. They do it with heart patients, I guess, who have mm -hmm. plaque buildup. Right. Okay. And th the procedure went well, but the patient almost died. He almost bled to death, and that was in recovery. Um, they hadn't sealed the entry wound. Uh, they they go through your groin area with a catheter. Mm -hmm. um, the procedure actually to do the to do the stents takes about forty five minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. And you're lightly sedated most of the time. So it's not really major surgery. But, any, but anytime you're opening up an artery, it's, it's dangerous. dangerous. And the net result was that I, I came very close to dying, um, going into shock. It was sort of like because having... you were bleeding. Well, it was Is like a really? knife wound. I was yeah. bleeding internally. Okay. And it wasn't obvious until I notified the nurses that I couldn't feel any feeling in my feet anymore. And I was starting to shake and going into cold, cold sweats. And yeah. my blood pressure dropped to a very low level. 
Um, as a result of that, I lost a lot of blood, so I became very weak, and it took about six weeks to rebuild me, you know, giving me epigen and, and just rest. And, and I, was, I was doing so well, and I was rather angry about this, and I started to reassess where I was. Um, I had been woodworking very successfully for almost 20 years. Uh, actually, originally as a hobby, at, at designing custom furniture and building it on my own and my own shop at home, and actually I'd taken it into a business and had clients all up and down the West Coast and had very high-end, one-of-a-kind furniture, really enjoying myself. Uh, but I was a little bit concerned with being on immunosuppressants and being around dust and, you know, wood products, so, that, 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 that it would be dangerous. I was wearing protective gear and respirators, and I looked like something out of Mars, you know, so it wasn't really that enjoyable. So when you were having this experience, you were really thinking about, how can I save my kidney? Am I going to do anything that'll impede the exactly. flow or hurt it because you became more aware how fragile this gift a was. Absolutely. So the, the net result was a lot of internal thinking and I decided to write about it. And I really had never thought that I would ever write a book. Mm -hmm. um, I've always written, it's been, I spent years in the corporate world and communications and writing was, you know, press releases, brochures, that kind of, mm -hmm. but I never thought about actually writing a memoir or a book about kidney disease. But I was motivated, and I found myself getting up at 5 in the morning and writing for two hours every day. And I wrote the first draft in two weeks. Oh, wow. My wife, who is also in communications and is a wonderful editor, and my caregiver and my partner for 41 years, um, said to me, this is fabulous, but you forgot about this, and you didn't talk about this, and you didn't talk <laughs> about this. So I wrote another draft, which doubled the size of the book. book. And because of the publishing industry, it's very hard for a non-celebrity to get a book published right. these days. And, you know, it's the disease of the month and all this kind of thing. I self-published on Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. And I had my own designer. And, you know, being a writer, and I had wonderful editors and a professional editor, a friend of mine in San Francisco. She looked at the drafts. And so the book came out in November of uh, 2009. It's available for sale on Amazon.com. And it's sort of nice. I get a little royalty check. Every three okay. months. Sorry. Well, one of the things I thought was interesting in your book, Becoming Me, is you talk a little bit about uh, relationships and how they impacted your care. Can you um, tell well, us a little I, bit about that? I started that? out writing about the kidney disease, and then I realized that throughout my life, I'd been very fortunate to have mentors, um, starting with my dad and my brother, um, my father-in-law, a man that I'd worked with for many years. And these people uh, sort of gave me life wisdom, if you will, mm -hmm. to have integrity, to be true to your own feelings, to, to really understand your own intuition and, and sometimes follow it over, over the advice of others and sometimes, you know, the logical thing to do. And my wife, also an extremely intuitive person, uh, and she taught me also how to trust that intuition. And because um, I tend to be a very empirical kind of guy, I'm a very, you know, well, prove it to me. You got to show me Black it and works. White. And to learn how to, and it's hard for a lot of guys to learn how to trust their emotions, that other side of them. We all have it. And when you learn that it's there and how to develop it, you'd be surprised what you can do with can your Can you life. give me an example how emotions have helped you navigate your care? Oh, yeah. I think. Um, the way I deal with doctors. I've learned that one has to be one's own advocate. Mm -hmm. And you are often your own best advocate. Um, it's a little difficult when you're sedated and then you need someone, a loved one, a care partner there for you. You really do. But, but when you're alert, um, you know best. You know your body better than anybody else. And I've learned to, to trust that. And there are many cases where Doctors would recommend one thing, and particularly, sadly, doctors don't communicate with each other, um, even in the same hospital. It's, it's amazing, <laughs> but they don't. And you have to be the conduit. You have to connect the right. dotted lines. And in a lot of times, it meant calling them and saying, look, you're not doing this. It needs to be done, and that's all there is to it. And they, it stops them because they're not used to dealing with patients who are that direct and that forthright. And what I've developed as a result of this process is many doctor friends now who think this is fabulous because it turns out that a patient who is self-directed and, and informed really makes it their job a lot easier and right. you get better faster. Exactly. Well, and it's interesting because um, I visited this new cardiologist one time and I went in there. It was pretty interesting. You know, we were talking for a couple of minutes. He was going over some of, you know, my history, maybe two or three minutes. And he goes, can you follow me? 
And then, you know, I walk out. So I think we're going to go to another room and have a discussion about something. He takes me to the appointment desk to make an appointment. And I thought, well, maybe he's busy, you know. And I'm like, okay, I'll give him another chance. So I went to see him again because I had a follow-up being approved for transplant. And the same thing happened. He goes, can you follow me? And, you know, the, the, the discussion wasn't quite finished in my opinion. But he took me right over to the appointment desk and said, can you make an appointment in X number of months? And, you know, my gut was, is like, he's just trying to get rid of me. And so I ended up finding another cardiologist. But, it, you know, it took me two visits to figure that out because he wasn't there to listen to me. He was just there to make another appointment. So you do have to use your emotions and figure out what's best for you, having a working relationship with a physician. That's very true. And, and they are human beings. Right. They are human beings. They, and and you, you find that when you find the good ones, those are the ones uh-huh. you want to keep because the ones that you can have a dialogue with and actually become a colleague with, which, I, which I've been able to do which mm-hmm. is really interesting. And, then, and it's led me actually into a whole new career. You've given up woodworking. Yes. And, uh, well, that's kind of a shame. I want to see some of your work. <laughs> well, I had me, a couple of projects up there for you. All my friends say that. And uh, when I took my website down, they said, oh, gee, that's too bad. And I said, well, I got a new website. I got a new career. I'm a full-time kidney patient advocate and educator. And they said, You are? And I said, yes, I am. I said, what I've learned over eight plus years of having Mm -hmm. kidney disease and still having kidney disease, you're never really out of it, even with the transplant. We don't get out of this alive. (laughs) That's for sure. (laughs) Was that I developed a body of information that was unique. And because of my communication skills and my people skills, it, it made sense. And I felt so many times that patients were getting short shrift, that doctors weren't taking the time to educate. And that there was a real gap that exists. And I got very involved. I was transplanted at USC. And I got very involved at USC um, to the point where I was asked to lecture to second-year medical students. Well, that's living. terrific because you can really get them to understand. They're a little bit more uh, open to new information when they're second-year medical students. Yes, they are. They haven't put on the white coat yet. Yes, they haven't got the God complex. But I, ha- I have to tell you, I've met a lot of younger doctors who I think offer great hope for medicine in this country. I really believe that. They're, they're much more um, open to dealing with patients and families, mm-hmm. to dealing with the emotional side, understanding the emotional side of being ill. The soft care of health care, not the hard care. Yes. The soft care is just as important as the hard care. It is, because I often think that, you know, we all, we've said for years that dialysis is 95% mental. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know whether that's... Totally true, but if you get over the hump of, of, of accepting it and then dealing with it and then living your life without letting dialysis dictate your life, which is difficult, it's very difficult to do, then you, you become much more of a whole person. I think a, do- a lot of the doctors, I've noticed a lot of them particularly who come from foreign backgrounds, who still have large families, they accept this automatically. And when, when they see a patient who has a great deal of, of humanity and uh, is not afraid to speak to them, is not afraid to question them, is not afraid to say, well, I don't understand. You have to explain this to me. Mm-hmm. Um, when they wind up with see a patient like that, they light up like a light bulb. It's unbelievable. And, well, it, it and that's is. a great, you know, you begin to understand they want that from you. Well, you know, um, I've been going to transplant clinic lately, and, you know, about half the people in clinic, you know, have no idea what's going on. And it's got to be really difficult because, as you said before, you have to connect the dots for the healthcare professionals. And if you're not connecting the dots, there's so many things that can go wrong. I mean, they could still go wrong when you're connecting the dots, but they're more likely to go wrong when somebody isn't there advocating for your care. And I think, you know, that's why managed care is becoming more popular because they're having a nurse manager help navigate this horrible, difficult system. So you talk a little bit about in your book about relationships with your family, but uh, could you talk a little bit about how this impacted your wife and what was her process of going through this with you? Well, I think Linda was as shocked as I was um, when I had kidney failure because I had lived a fairly healthy life. I'd exercised a lot. I'd eat, eaten well. I'm on the thin side. I'm not heavy, and I haven't, don't have diabetes or anything like that. Um, it was a big shock for both of us. And I know from reading and I know from actually talking to other people that 
A serious illness can break up a marriage, can break up any kind of relationship. I don't even if it's not a, even if you have a lover or or something. It it can people don't like being around sick people. It's very hard to deal with, and particularly kidney disease because kidney disease keeps you alive on dialysis, uh, but it's almost like a prison sentence. You never know when you're going to get out, right. and you never know if you're going to get a transplant, and it's a long haul, and. You also, if you're in clinic and you're only getting three-day dialysis, which I feel is terribly inadequate, um, I'm a big proponent of doing more dialysis and longer, longer treatment, um, you're never really able to work. So you feel useless and you get angry and that, that really sours a relationship. And when your, other, when your partner, when my wife in this case, is the breadwinner and you've been earning money and you sort of feel like, you know, well, what am I bringing to this relationship? And you get resentful, and then you get lonely, and you come home from dialysis, and you're tired, and you want, you want to be comforted, and all these kinds of things happen, and you get to the point where you're really, you know, you become an SOB, even well, you're though you might not in survival mode. You're in survival yeah. mode. <laughs> and you don't recognize it. It takes an outside party, and what we did in our case... As we found a young social worker who was part of the USC transplant program, wonderful, beautiful young woman who was, had wisdom beyond her years, and we went to see her together as a couple, which is very unusual, and I think it really helped because she could see the dynamic that was going on between my wife and myself. And she was a wonderful observer, and she taught me that I was really being unfair to my wife that my wife was doing a lot of things for me that I took for granted. You know, I mean, we'd been married a long time. And, and, you know, this advice that we got from the social worker really made me rethink and back off and really realize what was going on. And it also was instrumental in me getting out of in-center di- uh, dialysis and going to home hemo, mm-hmm. particularly after I had lost, I had two near experiences of getting transplants. The second time I was five days away from surgery, I had live donor friend of mine, and he was rejected. He had a small heart murmur that nobody knew about, and my wife just collapsed. Um, it's like you're getting ready, and you're getting, you think it's going to end, and then it she, starts all over again. Poor thing, she fell apart. Um, she heard the news, and literally within 24 hours, she had shingles. And fortunately, we were able to treat her, but shingles is one of these things that's awful to have. You know, you're bedridden, and you're, you're miserable. And here I was taking care of her, I'd lost the transplant. <laughs> but you, mean, I, you didn't get it. You were disappointed. And I should, you know, I, yeah, but I didn't have time to worry about being disappointed. And I really, I've been thinking all along, well, if I don't get the transplant, i got to have plan B. Mm-hmm. You always have to have plan right, B. Right, you always have to have plan and B. plan B was do my own dialysis at home. Regain my freedom, do it more often, and maybe I could work again. And, of course, that's exactly what happened. It got to the point where three years after into doing daily dialysis at home, hemodialysis at home, um, I almost became blasé about a transplant. When they called me with the news that I'd had it, you know, my first reaction was I'd just come out of my wood shop and I was really, really, it was a hot day, I was really sweaty, I needed a shower. It's about four in the afternoon, I'm pulling into my driveway. And they called from USC and they said, how are you feeling? And I said, fine, what's up? I said, we got a kidney for you. And my first question was, is it mine? Because I heard about you, you can be back up. Right. And they said, yeah, it's yours. It's a great match. We did a, bi- we did a biopsy on it, four of six antigens. How soon can you get here? They said, can I take a shower? <laughs> can I call my wife? <laughs> anyway, I was at the hospital an hour and a half later, and um, that was at 5.30. At 9, I was... It's surgery, and the next morning I had a kidney that was working. It's still working. Very fast. Very fast. Very fast. So things happen in life that way. They happen. And they just they they happen when you don't expect it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, so your your wife had shingles, and she was kind of basically breaking down emotionally. Exactly. In a lot of ways. So what did you do? You went um, decided to change dialysis to go. um, I went into support mode. I went into total support mode, and the interesting thing that happened is that she agreed that doing the home dialysis would be better because I would get more treatment and I wouldn't be as tired and saw that immediately. And because I actually had started out with, a, with an in-center machine, one of the big Fresenius machines at home, 
I became so knowledgeable that moving to the portable machine from next stage was a no brainer. Mm -hmm. And we were trained within a week and had the machine in our house. And for the first time, Linda said to me, you know, I really feel I'm helping because I can help you now. Well, she thought she probably saw that you were starting to take more control of your care by taking it home. And well, so I had my independence back uh-huh. again because I, I could start working again. I, I was doing okay. most of the cooking, most of the shopping. Um, the control of your life. <laughs> yeah, the disease wasn't controlling my life anymore. Yeah. And, I, and, and it's so critical. It's so critical. And, well, and also what it did was that it brought us even closer because Linda said for the first time, you know, even though she did minimal things like helping me remove the needles after, after doing dialysis and bandaging me, because you need another arm mm-hmm. or two or hands, it's helpful, <laughs> and monitoring what I was doing on the machine and so on. She felt that she was really doing something to help me rather mm-hmm. than just sitting there worrying about it. Right. So with this whole experience, she probably felt that you both had more control. Because when you go to the clinic and you don't really know what's going on, you're subject to a lot of other people being sick. Uh, I think one of the advantages of being home is you're not subject to that drama. I mean, I was in transplant clinic the other day. The guy had a heart attack in the waiting room. You know, they had to take him over to emergency and, you know, short of breath. So that impacts you because you're like, oh, that could be me. That's I right. mean, it's immediately what, what I think. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow, that could be me. And is that going to happen to me someday? Uh, I think the importance of being at home as much as possible is you control your surroundings. And that really makes a difference. You're also safer. I have right. to tell you, you're safer from infection uh, when you do home dialysis. I don't, whether it's PD or, or hemodialysis, you just... You're using your own equipment. You're getting more treatment, so you're getting cleaner blood. It just makes more sense. You're doing it more often. It sounds like it's more of a chore, but you're feeling so much better. You have so much more. I was able to go back to work full time. Wow. I was able to resume my business. Um, You know, my, my attitude just brightened entirely. And I think having gone through that experience, that once I got the transplant, it was like the doors wide open. Anything's possible. And, and it, that's what's basically happened. My wife kids me. She's close to retirement. And we're both in our mid-60s. And she's close to retirement now. And people say to her, well, what are you going to do when you retire? And she said, I'm going to manage David's career. <laughs> <laughs> so with this whole experience of this social worker sitting you down and seeing the dynamic, did you both change your behaviors? Yeah, I certainly did. And like, give, us, give me an example. I mean, you, you did see that. Uh, I stopped being angry. Okay, because you started, you know, because when you, you're diagnosed fe- with an illness, your world gets very small. I stopped feeling sorry for myself. And, you know, seeing that it's not always about you. I realized how lucky I really was. To have somebody, yeah, because, you know, you go to clinic, you go to, and you see people all alone, and they're, you know, relying on their friends to bring them food, or, you know, go shopping for them when they're sick. We're, we're very lucky to have loving support partners, because it is difficult, but I know for myself, when you're in a crisis, you basically just become, oh my God, you're in survival mode, and you don't think you're going to survive, so that uh, instinct comes up, and you really can't think about anything else. Yeah, and I think one of the other things you learn is to accept help. Right. A lot of us want to be independent. Right. We, we feel we want to be strong, and, and we don't want to bother people. It's not just having a spouse or a lover. There are friends who want to help you if you're by yourself. When they reach out to you, you have to accept that. Right. You, you can't just look. depend on one person, put it all on one person. You have to kind of spread it out. Exactly. We're not, you know, no man is an island, they say. Right. So... Basically, you wrote this book, Becoming Me. So maybe can you sum up a little bit some tips for patients who are listening? It sounds to me like you've really found your stride of what makes you happy and what's important in life. I'm a very passionate person. I have a lot of passions. I love opera. I love sports. um, I love airplanes. I love trains. (laughs) Um, Maybe you should say what you don't love. No, I'm just kidding. I love (laughs) lighthouses, and I go see them and visit them. you just have to grab it and do it. Right. You have to embrace and one life. And one of the things I feel very passionate about is, is um, getting rehabilitative dialysis. And that's why I've become very active um, both at my transplant center at USC. I'm about to start a patient education program there. Um, but also uh, with an outside group of Next Stage users who advocates uh, rehabilitative dialysis for everybody, regardless of what you're doing. And I become very. I become. I'm on the board of that organization and running the communications now. And we're a young organization. And we're growing, but 
we feel like we're having an impact because we're, we're educating people. It's not enough just to get well yourself. You need to share. That's my right. feeling. And that's well, you have I'm, to take help, give help. <laughs> yeah, and that's where, that's, I think that's what I've learned, and I think it's, I'm at the point in my life where it's time to give back. And now, how long have you been transplanted? Uh, two and a half years. It'll be and, three years in August. And what's your creatinine, may I ask? <laughs> my creatinine is, is right around 1.8. 1. Probably 8. is going to be there. Um, it's the function of the donor's kidney because the, the, both kidneys from the donor were transplanted and the other recipient's creatinine is the same. Okay, that's interesting. So we know that and I insisted on finding that out. Finding that out to see what it was. Yes. Well, you know, as I said before, my creatinine was 2.2 for 20 years. So the, the most important thing is just being consistent. <laughs> yes, it is. You know? and, I, and it's also being very diligent about your meds, about getting those blood tests every six to eight weeks. I mean, it is, um, you get used to being in hospitals and being in clinics. Right. And you know your way around. And, and the more you know about it, you know, there's sort of like little, it's like being a long distance runner or being an athlete. You, there, you know, there are trials and there are timings and those are, it's what you're doing. You're basically tuning your body. Well, one of the things that I think that, you know, is so important for patients to, to understand is that we're not the only one living with this illness. It impacts our family members, our friends, and we really have to take a step back and think about how it impacts them because, you know, we could end up alone and angry. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, and unfortunately, I do meet some patients who are alone and angry. And I guess the, the, the point of wisdom here is that, you know, we got to really be aware so we don't alienate people. I mean, having an illness makes you angry. You go through all the emotions, shock, denial, fear, anger, depression, grief, and then finally understanding acceptance. But it is a process. And, you know, I always suggest to people, you know, go see a therapist. It's, it's okay to go see a therapist. Oh, definitely. These are very difficult, life-threatening, emotional issues. In fact, issues. I have to tell you another, the real, the story why the book was suggested that I write a book. I, at one point, um, when I was still on dialysis, I went to see a social worker, family social worker, who dealt with people with long-term illnesses. In fact, he was a cancer survivor. He was also an artist. He was a fa fabulous um, older man. And I saw him for about four or five months. Um, once every two weeks, I believe. And the sessions became very enjoyable, actually. And we talked about a lot of things. We just didn't talk about my illness. We talked about politics. We talked about philosophy. And he said to me at one point, you should write a book. You're a philosopher. And I said, oh, no, I'm not. He says, yes, you are. I said, I don't really have anything new to tell the world. He said, yes, you do. You have a unique point of view. And I think everybody does. Right. I really think everybody does. Everybody has a different perspective. Well, thank you, David, for coming on Kidney Talk. And if you want to get his book, you can go to Amazon.com and look up Becoming Me by David Rosenblum. And uh, any closing words you'd like to say to people? No, just... Never give up, huh? Well, you know, <laughs> tomorrow's always a new day. Right. No, you really have to step back. And, you know, I know for myself, I sometimes tend to beat myself up because you get frustrated at yourself that you can't do what you used to do. And that really isn't good for anybody. You have to really, you know, start where you are and just try to improve every day. So, uh, well, thank you very much, David, and I look forward to your next book. Thank you, Lori. We can control our own destiny. We can take charge of our health and ask questions about our medical options. We can form partnerships with our health care team. We can take steps towards self-improvement. We can be sensitive to the impact of our disease on our family. We can sing, dance, laugh, and enjoy our lives. We can appreciate today and look forward to tomorrow. We can help and support our fellow patients. We can pursue our hopes and dreams. We can make a difference. 